an awesome song. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, all the drummers. And the shakers. Um, you guys put forth such beautiful music. We're blessed by it every time we sing the drums. So this morning I want to read from the Gospel of Matthew. It's uh, Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. This is the English Standard Version translation, and the scripture is printed on the back. Or if you brought your own hymnal, I encourage you to open it up to chapter 17 of Matthew. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. This is the word of God. For you, the people of God. Today I'm, I'm talking about Transfiguration Sunday, which is uh, a particular Sunday in our Christian calendar in which we reflect on what just happened with Jesus. Before I begin talking about that more specifically, I want to share this. In a small Christian community, over 500 miles away, there was a midweek service held in the college chapel where the preacher began his preaching by saying, we're going to continue in Romans 12. That's the star. God's Word and Jesus and the Holy Spirit moving in our midst. That's what we're hoping for. I hope you guys forget me, but anything of the Holy Spirit and God's Word will find fertile ground on your heart and produce fruit in your life. Now, while we're not spending time in Romans 12 today, I do want to share that this is a letter that Paul writes to the church in Rome, and he exhorts the people to be transformed, to be changed. And he gives them directives such as, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Hate what is evil. Bless those who persecute you. Do not be proud. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. And this chapter is all about Paul exhorting the people to transformation. And in the Gospels, another story of transformation takes place on a mountaintop. We see it in the scripture that I just read. That mountaintop transfiguration is found in all three of the synoptic gospel, gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
Matthew tells of a change in Jesus' form, but not in his character or his identity. His character is the same. Who he was before is the same as now. His identity as God's son was declared long before this mountaintop miracle, and that has not changed. But through this transfiguration, the disciples are given an outward glimpse of Jesus' inward glory uh, that's only waiting to be fully revealed. And what a wonderful place for us to begin our Lenten journey together with the promise of what is to come. And when we embark on a journey, isn't it good to know what's at the end? Where we're going? What's the goal line? If we're given a puzzle, isn't it good to have that picture on the box to look and say, well, that will be the end piece. Now let me make that. If you're running a marathon, isn't it good to know where the finish line is? So you don't have to run any further than that. Perhaps this is why Jesus brings Peter and James and John up the mountain with him. It's important that they know what is to come, especially in light of what Jesus has been telling the disciples. Our reading today begins with these words, after six days. And six days later can only mean that six days earlier, something of significance took place. And we see, when we read the end of chapter 16, Jesus is telling the disciples that he must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And of course, this isn't something the disciples wanted to hear. Who in their right mind would want to hear their beloved leader? tell them that they fully expect suffering and rejection and death. In fact, this is so contrary to what the disciples want to hear or expect to hear that Peter, that outspoken, impetuous, and at times temperamental disciple, takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. Peter rebukes Jesus Christ. Peter, the student, rebukes Jesus, the leader, the teacher. Peter, the sinner, rebukes Jesus, Son of God. Sounds a little bit ridiculous when I, when I put it that way, doesn't it? He criticizes Jesus. He says, no, you're wrong. That's not going to happen. And Jesus, in turn, then rebukes Peter by saying, get behind me, Satan. Satan, you're a hindrance to me. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, rather on the things of man or humanity. Now, in fairness to Peter, the disciples have been told by Jesus that he would die, and three days after that, he would rise from the dead. And they got the, the death part. They understood that. It was part of their life. But they did, couldn't grasp the resurrection. They couldn't understand what that meant. And so Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain along with him where a stunning transfiguration takes place. Jesus' appearance his clothing, his robe become dazzling white. No amount of bleach or detergent or, or dry cleaning could affect how that clothing looked. And suddenly be, beside Jesus, there's two figures, Elijah and Moses. Now why Elijah and Moses? Well, they're two of the most important figures in Israel's history. 
Moses brings God's law to the people, and Elijah was the preeminent prophet of Israel. Both Elijah and Moses, they, they bring along an es eschatological, eschatological, yes, eschatological, eschatological, thank you, Grace, dimension to this mountaintop. I know that's a sign I should quit using the four-syllable words in sermons. But it's an important word because it gives us insight. Eschatology is all about end times. Uh, what takes place after our life here on earth. The afterlife. And that's precisely what their conversation is about. Jesus, Moses, and Elijah are talking about the end of Jesus' life. And Matthew's account is straightforward and bare bones. And it just tells us that they are together. But Luke gives a little bit more detail, telling us that the three spoke about Jesus' death, his departure from earthly life, and that that departure would take place in the city of Jerusalem. Not a normal departure as we know. Non-normal departures from earthly life are something that both Elijah and Moses are familiar with and have experience with. Second Kings tells us that Elijah, at the time of his ending, was not struck down. He wasn't run through with a spear or sword. He didn't die of old age. Instead, he was taken up into the heavens by a chariot of fire, lifted in a whirlwind. And then Moses, he too has mystery surrounding his death. When his time comes at the end of the 40 of the 40 year wilderness journey, as they're on that river looking into the promised land, Moses is 120 years old. But he hasn't lost any of his eyesight, he hasn't lost any of his strength. He is in body and in will as strong as he's ever been. But as God said, he will not be crossing in to the promised land. And we know that it's not his people that end up burying him, but rather the Lord buried him in a valley in Moabite country across from Beth Peor. Even now, no one knows where Moses' grave is. There's great mystery surrounding the death of Moses. And so all three, Jesus, Elijah, and Moses, have gathered on this mountaintop besides Jesus' death. What else do they talk about? One reference says they were there for at least one day. But we don't know what else they talked about. Scripture doesn't tell us. During that day they were on the mountaintop, Peter felt the need to speak up and to say something of particular wisdom, perhaps an attempt to gain back favor in the eye of Jesus after his braiding, after Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan. But that's not really necessary because Jesus had already forgiven him. Jesus, in that forgiveness, welcomed him up to the mountaintop. Peter, Peter interrupts the conversation that the three are having and says to his teacher, Lord, it's good that we're here. Lord, it's good that I'm here. I'm here for you. I will make three tents, one for you, one for Elijah, and one for Moses. Now perhaps this is one of those moments where He's just not sure what to say, but feels like he has to say something of wisdom and pithiness when he probably should have just not said anything at all. But doesn't that sometimes happen to us where we're in a, in a silence, in a kind of a vacuum and uh, you're just not quite sure what to say or you really feel like, I just have to say something. It's too quiet here. 
And so you think and think and think and you have this great wise saying, maybe what you consider a funny little joke, something to share with the group and you share it and you realize I should just not have said anything. Well, this is Peter. This is Peter. He wasn't sure what to say, but felt compelled to say something. But the problem is, when we read the Bible, we understand we get no non sequiturs. What is said is said for a purpose, although we don't always understand what that purpose is. We may not know how the pieces fit together although they do. Peter talks about putting up a shrine or a booth, a tent, a tabernacle, depending on which translation you read. And in some ways, Peter wants this moment to live on. There should be some indication that something miraculous happened here today, took place right here on this mountain, and he wants to draw out this glorious event. Well, that's not so different than what we do today, is it? Our glorious event this morning was the baptism. And I saw more than a few cameras out taking pictures, making videos. Well, that's how we capture those small we pull out our smartphone and we begin taking pictures or we hit video and record and then we post to Facebook or Instagram or, or Twitter or wherever people are posting nowadays. We want to remember that moment. It's special in our lives. We don't want to forget it. We want to be able to look back years later and say, I remember when Peyton was this small and was baptized. So it's not the worst idea Peter's ever had. It's, it's just not the right time. It's not the right moment or place. Jesus the Messiah is deserving of much more than a tent. Jesus' very nature radiates glory. He is fully human, fully divine. And that's a mystery to us. But like Peter, James, and John, we accept it even though we don't understand it. Jesus gives them this glimpse of his godliness, but he also lets them know that his transfiguration must not be spoken of to anyone else. And it must not be spoken of separately from his upcoming death and resurrection. You see, all three of those are intrinsically entwined. Uh, death, resurrection, and divine glory. There is no divine glory apart from his faith. No life apart from death. No claiming his throne or taking his place in the divine court apart from his mission to serve humanity and to be rejected even while doing God's will. Saving man, woman, and child. Through suffering, rejection, and despair, the power of God is with us until that final coming of God's glory. And on occasion, we catch a glimpse of that glory, much like Peter and James and John did. Now, our glimpse of glory might be seen in, in something like the end of a chapel worship service. Like the one I shared with you at the beginning of this message. <clears throat> that particular service took place on February 8th at Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky. On the 8th, at the end of the service, the altar was flooded with over 100 students and that worship and prayer service has continued 24 hours a day since then. With thousands of people coming from around the, the state and the country. I even read of a, a clergy who was flying in from out of the country. 
to lead a worship service. And I can't recall where, but he contacted his host and said, I'd rather go to Asbury to see what's happening there. Would that be okay? And so he changed his plans and ended up in Wilmore, Kentucky, rather than the place where he was going to lead his own worship. Lines are formed to get inside that chapel, and they're over a half a mile long down the road. From Asbury University, it spilled over into Asbury Theological Seminary, right across the road from the university. And then from there, at least three other universities in Sanford, Alabama, Lee University in Tennessee, and Cedarville University in Ohio have seen this same movement of the Holy Spirit. All of this has been student-led and Holy Spirit-driven. No premier preacher has been brought in. No well-known Christian music group has been hired. Nothing is scripted, nothing is planned. No professors, no university presidents are leading this. It's the kids. The teens and the tweens and the 30-something. The students on the campus have began to feel the Holy Spirit moving within them. And instead of leaving the sanctuary, the chapel, after their service to go back to their classrooms or maybe back home, they stayed. And they came up to the altar. Now, I know in, in our area, we're not all that familiar with what an altar call is. Uh, maybe some of you are. Uh, I didn't first experience it until I was in the South. An altar call is when the, the preacher invites those who want to come to know Christ, to accept Christ as Lord and Savior, to come up and, and kneel. Some churches have kneelers. Some have steps. Can you picture a hundred students lined up in front of the altar, making that altar call, committing and recommitting themselves to Jesus Christ?